Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from New Financial, William Wright and CEO of Unicredit, Jean-Pierre Mustier. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, London on a perfectly normal week for British politics. Uh, welcome to this Views from the Top with Jean-Pierre Moustier, the Group Chief Executive uh, and of, of Unicredit, yeah. and Elket, yeah. uh, who's here for, for, for comfort and support. And today we're going to be discussing industry transformation with a focus on SMEs. Now Jean-Pierre needs no introduction, but just in case you haven't been paying attention to European banking over the past few decades, he's been Group Chief Exec at Unicredit now for just over three years, uh, after a long career at Société Générale, mainly in the corporate and investment bank. Most recently, he's taken up the role uh, as president of the European Banking Federation. So welcome, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much. Um, now, today, we're going to be talking about the shifting nature of innovation in banking and the wider economy, how in particular that applies to SMEs and growth companies, the backbone of, Euro of the European economy, and how banks, most importantly, how banks need to rethink their approach to SMEs in the face of disruptive competition uh, from an ever-growing number of challenges, new entrants, and fintechs. We only have half an hour, so, so let's get cracking. But um, firstly, Jean-Pierre, I just wanted to sort of summarize the thesis that we're going to be exploring today. Um, and it basically runs that innovation has traditionally been driven from the top down by big banks, by larger companies, and then trickled down through to smaller firms. And that's now been reversed that SMEs and, uh, are driving innovation from the bottom up uh, with access to technologies that were previously reserved for much, much larger firms. And given the vital role that SMEs play in the European economy as an and as an important customer base for banks, it's imperative that banks better understand their changing demands and expectations and requirements, and that banks rethink their relationship with SMEs to embrace change, develop innovative products, uh, and services with plenty of alternative firms, many of whom, I mean, hundreds of firms at Cybos this week would very gladly take your business with SMEs away from you if you don't respond in that way. But let's start with the big picture, and, and perhaps if you could just outline um, briefly what you see as the big trends at a sort of global and European level uh, driving the transformation, the disruption uh, in banking. Well, I, I think that... Uh we have to deal with two issues, the present and the future. And um, you know, the bank of the present has to change. One can speak about legacy issues. At Unicredit in 2018, in our Italian, German, and Austrian network, we generated 51 kilometers of papers, if you put them on top of each other uh, in our branches. So clearly, you can uh, show that uh, we need to digitalize uh, our process. For that, we need to... Uh, uh, reduce the number of products, uh, improve the process, automatize, basically. So very so clearly on the bank of the present, many things to be done in order to uh, uh, gain productivity, uh, improve the client interaction, and uh, uh, develop our business. But uh, we need to think as well at the bank of the future with uh, investments which are more difficult to uh, quantify today and impact which are pushed back. I mean, when we speak about big data, in banking today, the big data applies more to control, risk, compliance, uh, uh, audit, rather than the marketing side, which has some impact, but which is uh, more limited. So uh -huh. let's uh, focus on the bank of the present, changing uh, uh, of the client behaviors, uh, needing on the transaction automatized and easy to use uh, product, proper advisory, free up the team members for execution and from administrative tasks to spend time with the client, and let's uh, think about the bank of the future to see which kind of investment we can make, but being extremely focused and very careful about not doing too many things which uh, mm -hmm. not, will not bring the right returns. And, and in banking and finance, supervision, regulation are, are, are never far away from the debate. In the context of digitalization, disruption, innovation, do you, I mean, how can European supervisors and regulators keep up with the pace of change? And are there signs, in your view, that they're struggling to do so? Mm. I think there are two specific issues in terms of change. One is uh, linked to cybersecurity, which is uh, with GDPR, 
not only a regulatory issue, but also a, a financial risk for uh, any participant. And on the cyber side, everybody is exposed uh, directly with uh, your own system or indirectly with the third party you use. So you have to be extremely careful about uh, the way you can operate. I think it's fair to say that uh, we cannot bet that uh, we will never have any penetration or violation of our system. So we need to be very, very uh, strict uh, about to protect our client data and uh, make sure that when we use client data, we can encrypt them. When we send them outside, they can remain encrypted so that at least if there is a violation, uh -huh. the client data are protected. And so cybersecurity is an issue about regulation, but also about implementation. And this is for the financial uh, intermediaries, but also for their suppliers, IT company and, and others. The second thing which is important in the pace of innovation is uh, the ethical use of data. Mm. Uh, today, banks have a lot of data, not use them very efficiently, probably, but we have banking secrecies which uh, are limiting us to a certain extent. We have to make sure that uh, the uh, ethical use of the bank data can be properly defined. And with the European Banking Federation, we are going to work on a, a specific set uh, of recommendations. I think the industry needs to be more proactive than the GAFA, for instance, which are completely behind the curve. I think the banking uh, 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 industry needs to be forward-looking. And finally, we need to have a, a level playing field. Mm. Uh, with uh, uh, PSD2, we are asked to open up our data to uh, everybody, which is fine. You know, that's the rule. But uh, if one of my clients wants me to have access to his data on Amazon or Google, Amazon and Google will say no. This is not a level playing field. And so with the EBF, I'm going to push super hard to make sure that we have a level playing field. Mm -hmm. There is no reason why it should be an asymmetric treatment of banks. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's look at the, the, the thesis that the nature of innovation itself has changed. I mean, if we rewind to 25, 20, 25 years ago, earlier in your career, um, I mean, how, how would you say that innovation <coughs> has, has developed and changed in banking from being largely top-down to now at a, at a much lower level in the organization, a much lower level in terms of the size of companies you're dealing with? Well, I think actually that innovation in banking 20 years ago was very much bottom-up. If you look at what at the time was driving changes with the development of capital market, of derivative, that was super bottom-up by a small group of people within the bank changing, developing new products, new activities, new client uh, uh, business. Uh, but it's fair to say that today we have, in addition to the banks, a certain number of uh, other players, call them fintech, IT companies, uh, which are bringing very good ideas and that, I think, is very profitable for the clients who mm -hmm. can have uh, improved service, improved quality of product. And clearly, banks have to adapt or to anticipate. But if I'm a little bit uh, provocative, I would say that I strongly encourage uh, uh, you know, venture capitalists to put a lot of money in fintechs because in banking, there is no copyright. So if there is a good idea, if people invested a lot of money into it, I can copy it. And guess what? I have 52 billion of capital and 26 million of clients. So I can use it immediately with all our clients. And I'm a super competitive uh, sports person. So I can tell you we can copy that super quickly. Mm -hmm. And if we don't think copying makes sense, then we partner with uh, third parties uh, to use them. And so it's an ecosystem which I think is um, you know, positive, new ideas that can be used, or partnership which can be developed. And partnership as well with GAFA, we think that it's better to be proactive than play the ostrich, basically, and uh, put our hand in the sand. And so we were the first one to introduce Apple Pay in Italy, for instance. We have uh, Apple, Samsung, Google Pay, and, and uh, Alipay, basically. And uh, the more we can partner, the better it is, because it's better to lead the disruption than to resist the disruption. Mm -hmm. So we are very open for that as well. And I want to come back to, to, to how you at Unicredit and how the industry has responded. But I mean, one of the things that strikes me with innovation and, and disruption in banking is, particularly in Europe, that there's arguably already a problem with overcapacity and fierce competition between banks, incumbent banks. You're facing competition not just in terms of challenger banks, but people, firms coming in on particular channels. You've got your rival firms reinventing their, their, their digital proposition. 
Um, and then, of course, you've got this entirely separate wave of competition from potential competition from tech giants like Amazon, PayPal, um, potentially longer term Google and others. How does that make you sort of, how do you think, I mean, is, is that competition, uh, how, I mean, how would you characterize the, 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 the nature of competition and disruption? In, in, that, in that context? Well, I think it's very healthy to have competition. Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, I'm doing a lot of sports, and uh, when uh, I'm a keen sailor, and I'm practicing with people who are much better than me, it helps me progress. So if we have uh, other players who are better than us, it helps us progress, and we have to learn from that. I think what is important to understand in banking is that at the end, what do the client want? Of course, they want a nice product. They want a product which is user-friendly. They want whatever. But a, a financial institution needs to provide security. Security for the money you have, for your deposit, for the transaction you have. And so at the end, what do you need? You need to have a lot of capital. Even transaction where you know, just offer transaction, you have operational risk. We spoke about cyber, for instance. So I think that the competition should be an incentive for us. But at the end, uh, I think that uh, you know, the true nature of financial institution is to have a very, very strong balance sheet. You cannot have a sustainable financial institution which keeps losing money and uh, which uh, has only one goal, which is to acquire more clients by losing money. At the end, it is not sustainable. The end game for these companies is to be bought by mm -hmm. others. This is not our end game, basically. Our end game is to protect our client deposit, our client activity. And so we use competition to be fitter and at the same time to change and to evolve. But I am extremely comfortable, while not being in denial, that uh, you know, financial institution which will last and uh, which will be able to develop client activity needs to have a huge amount of capital and a footprint which is very large. Uh -huh. Let's zoom in on, on SMEs. I mean, could you just remind us from a European perspective and perhaps an Italian perspective on the, the importance of SMEs, not only to the economy, but also to, to banking as an industry, as a customer segment? Well, it is very important. SMEs produce today or represent today 60 to 70 percent of the jobs in Europe. Mm -hmm. Unicredit is the second largest lender to SMEs in Europe. We have a large bank in Italy, a large bank in Germany, a large bank in Australia, and we lend around three, uh, 350 billion euros to SMEs. It's a large amount of loans, basically. And I, I've met so far this year on a one-to-one -one basis, 175 uh, uh, SME clients. I try to meet one or two clients per day when I'm in Italy, Germany, and Austria. So, you know, these SME clients are absolutely important for the European economy and for us. What do they need? They need to trust their bank and they need advice from their bank. Of course, they can get products which are more efficient in terms of payment, uh, in terms of credit card, in terms of whatever. But at the end, when I meet an SME entrepreneur, what he wants is to discuss what can be strategy, what is the appropriate capital structure that he should have, and uh, how he can develop his activity beyond borders. And for an SME company in Europe, Developing beyond the borders of his domestic country is not very easy because mm -hmm. they have to reinvent mm -hmm. completely their company. Uh, German SME, if they want to develop in Italy or whatever, needs to discover a new language, a new HR regulation, a new tax regulation. So Europe is a single market, but it's still very fragmented. And what we need is the banks to help and accompany the SMEs in their development. So as we have 14, a presence in 14 countries, which is where our SMEs export the most in Europe mm -hmm. and in Central and Eastern Europe. And at the end, we need to improve, and we still have a lot to improve on the transaction side to make it much smoother. But the SMEs need the advice and the support we can give them their international development. And, and, and do you think that, I mean, Unicredit accepted, do, do, do you think that the banking industry in Europe has done a particularly good job in the past decade of servicing, of looking after this important segment? I think that, the, you know, there is a, for SMEs, um, I mean, um, you know, a view, and that was developed by the Capital Market Union, by the Commission, that we need to split the SMEs from the bank uh, because SMEs need to access capital market. The truth is, SMEs in Europe are not SMEs in the US. Mm. They are S and M and not large uh, yeah, uh, yeah. companies. Yeah. And so accessing capital market is super expensive for them. 
And the vast and majority should never go anywhere near a capital. Market. And they probably should not, because what they want is a bank which finance their working capital, capital market don't do that, which, uh, you know, finance their leasing needs, uh, which uh, give them amortizing loan on a, you know, specific duration, which uh, the capital market don't do. So I think that the banks need to be close to their SME clients in order to help them in their financing. So the capital market union, from my point of view, missed the point. Uh -huh. It's not splitting the borrower from the lender, but it is what is super important for the SMEs, and which I discussed in my 175 meeting this year. I think for maybe 174 of them, we discussed patient minority equity capital. Why? When an SME has a gross prospect, a bank loan is not a substitute for equity. SMEs need to have access to capital if they want to grow. And it's not a loan which can allow them to do that. It's to have access to minority equity uh -huh. because entrepreneurs don't want to sell control. And it needs to be patient capital. So we launched an initiative at Unicredit in Italy, which we're going to expand uh, to Germany. We pulled two, two billion of patient minority capital coming from patient investors, so seven, 10 years or even more, to be minority equity investors with SMEs who have a need to grow. And of course, we guarantee all the lending that is needed afterwards when the capital structure is right. So yeah. Europe needs to focus on uh, the right issues, which is probably supporting venture capital investment. Uh, venture capital in continental Europe in 2017 or 18 was a tenth of the US, a fifth of Asia. That's a catastrophe. If we want to have SMEs in the future, we need to have startups, and we don't have enough European capital to do that. And Europe needs to focus on gross capital as well. So we need to have a better offer, better supply of capital, of risk capital, to help our SMEs. That's the key focus of the Capital Market Union dot to zero. And, and uh, I'm slightly biased, speaking as the owner and majority owner of an SME myself, but how would you say the demands and expectations of SMEs have changed in relation to their banks. I mean, one, one data point from a recent report in the UK, you mentioned you'd seen 175 clients this year. The big five banks between them in the UK ask 171 different questions, 171 different questions of SMEs just to open a bank account. Only 19 of those questions are the same. It, it seems that it, it's, it, as, a, as an SME, it, it's, it's quite difficult to find the right bank and to get that bank to look after you in a way that you would hope to be looked after. You're right, but it's not only for SMEs, actually. It's uh, for every client. We um, you know, run an exercise in our German bank um, to um, uh, cut the uh, account opening time. Uh, we had, uh, at the end of 2018, um, for a client willing to open a bank account, retail or SME, 150 page, uh, 40 signatures. Uh, and so it was taking uh, 50 minutes for a client with a, a account officer to do that. Uh, uh. We simplified the process. Why? Because for the past 30 years, nobody has looked at simplifying the process. So a legal person, a compliance person just added up one more page, one more signature. We cut that to 14 minutes, one four, from uh, 80 minutes to 14 minutes, and only one electronic signature. And we are cross-selling three products in addition to the current account. Mm. So basically, mm. you're right. For SMEs, but for their client, we need to simplify the product, simplify the number of products, simplify the process, and automatize it. And that applies to everybody, and uh, that's what we're doing under, if I may say, the friendly pressure of uh, alternative banks, startups, etc., which force us to do that. So this is a benefit uh, yeah. for our clients, and uh, we need to move more quickly on that. Unicredit will be paperless on our retail business and SMB business in Italy by mid-2020. So, you know, we're making progress, and we will save the rainforest in addition mm -hmm. to not uh, generating 51 kilometers of paper next year. But when we, when we look at some of the most disruptive and successful tech companies, and I'm looking well beyond fintech. I mean, one of the, the key differentiators is the, 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 the customer experience, the, the sense of personal connection, even if it is only a, an illusory sense of personal connection. How can, how can banks respond to that, or hope to deliver the same sort of ease of customer experience? 
Well, there's a, first of all, in the daily interaction in the multi-channel side, you need to make sure that you have a consistent uh, uh, offer to the client, whether it's uh, internet mobile or mm -hmm. going to a, a branch or, or seeing one of our team members. Two is uh, through automation, so the improvement of uh, uh, the process. You free up time of our team members so that they can dedicate more time uh, to the client and give them advice directly through call center or through uh, basically uh, uh, any application, internet or the mobile app. So the key focus today for us um, is uh, on the new plan we're going to communicate to the, uh, the market on December 3rd, is to move from uh, hard restructuring that we did in the past three years. We cut 1.7 billion of cost, cost reduction not gross saving, net saving. That's a lot of money, 1.7 uh -huh. billion. We cut 20% of our team members in Europe and 25% in the branches. That's brutal. So clearly when you do that, client satisfaction is not improving. But the new plan is about fo being very focused on client satisfaction to gain new clients, improve the quality of service, and dedicate our team members to serve the client. And so everybody has to do that. When you build a company from scratch, you clearly have a competitive advantage because you don't have to deal with the legacy. We have to deal with the legacy, but we are making sure we can do that as quickly as possible. And how much, how much more of your process, your legacy systems, particularly for a firm that's been involved in, in M&A over the years, how much, more, how much scope is there to, to continue to to automate and, and, and improve the efficiency of that process? Well, there's a, a lot of scope, and uh, you know, clearly we have legacy system. You know, the big bang to switch to a new system is not the proper solution, so it's a vertical decommissioning of application uh, that uh, we're working on, and uh, having uh, on top of our application a, a proper layer for API, which uh, uh, will help us uh, progress. So there are ways, if you want to uh, deal with the legacy system and improve the, uh, the offer to the client. What is interesting as well is to benefit from the best-in-class experience. At Unicredit, as I said, we have 14 banks, in uh, Italy, Germany, Austria, and 11 banks in the CE side. You know, some of our banks in the CE have the best-in-class experience because they are new banks. And so with new banks, you have systems which are super more efficient, yeah. and we learn from what they are doing. Our bank in Turkey is paperless. So we have been learning from our experience to speed up becoming paperless in Italy, so Germany, and Austria. they've effectively so gone straight, straight exactly, to digital. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's uh, something which uh, is very useful mm. uh, when uh, you want to develop the activity. Because there's a, there's a and I, I'm sure it's a, an apocryphal story, but apparently somewhere buried inside the computer servers of one of the big UK banks, there is a, a program that has to convert some payments from pounds into old pounds, shilling, and pence to do the transaction. Does the transaction and then co converts it back. Ah, so, but and, I, and I'm sure there's somewhere somewhere buried in an Italian bank, obviously not Unicredit, something that's still doing transactions no, in No, 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 but if the UK had joined the Euro, we would not have this uh, problem. Voila. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll come to the, we'll come to some. Might some come soon, actually. We never <laughs> know. Huh? And, uh, things are moving quickly. Yeah. How, I mean, as we move towards a more open banking uh, environment, I mean, how, how do banks retain their existing relationships, which often go back many, many years, once you start introducing third parties into the value chain, once you start introducing partner firms or additional services, non-banking services perhaps, and it's one of the things as an SME owner I would love to see my bank offering is non-bank services to me. Um, how does that affect your relationship with, with your 26 million clients? Well, actually, the better quality of service we deliver directly or indirectly, the happier should be our client. And as I said, if you look at what is a bank, a bank is an institution which takes risk to serve its client and which has a strong balance sheet to protect the client uh, 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 asset. And so, you know, banks are not pure intermediaries, not taking any risk. That does not exist. Mm. And even if you don't take any risk, you have operational risk and you need strong capital. So basically, I mean, we retain a relationship because the client understands that they want to work with an institution which protects them. My sons who are millennial go from one startup to another based on, uh, you know, the level of deposits that they can get at 50 basis points more. They are going to close their account with one to open up with another one because they have no money. 
are my sons today the target of Unicredit? Of course, because they will become one day a little bit more wealthy. But I think that what is important... And frankly, is it would be disappointing if your sons didn't bank with, uh, with Unicredit. Well, you know, we, we see. <laughs> but, you know, what, what is important is that a lot of our clients, you know, consider the bank as yeah. a safe partner. And for that, we maintain the relationship. And if we add on top of that, you know, a better quality of service or alternative product, the client is happier and there is no reason why they should leave. Banking business is actually extremely sticky. But, 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 but every single part of your value proposition, every single process within the chain is currently under, as you say, uh, under attack. It's healthy competition. It keeps you on your toes. But whether it's SME lending or cash flow management or FX or payments, or cross-border payments, how, how do you remain, I mean, how can banks retain and in many cases aspire to a, a, a sustainable level of prof profitability under that sort of competitive or that, that, that concerted competitive pressure well, on every, every part of your business? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the fact that uh, you know, fees, commissions are under pressure is not new. Basically, it has always existed. So, you know, we should not base our business model by thinking that we protect uh, our level of fees. So I think that the quality of service, you know, the ability to tell the client you can count on us, the fact that the clients know that, uh, you know, if they need something, we can work with them is the, the way for us to keep some pricing power. We know that on some of the products, you mentioned payment, for instance, the, you know, the level of fees and commission are going to go to zero. Why not negative? You know, if you want to have access mm -hmm. to the client data, well, that's fine. You know, there are other levels of services which can be developed. And then with automation, we will cut the cost. So I think it's as much, you know, better quality of service on one side, cost optimization. You know, we cut 1.7 billion of cost. We are going to announce a new plan where we are going to have to do as well cost optimization. So it's uh, as much a revenue side and a cost side, basically. That is not an issue. That's what we have to do every day. What is more important is actually the ability of European bank to attract capital. Because today we have uh, with, uh, you know, the negative rate, and I don't comment on the monetary policy, but uh, potentially pressure on the net income, which might not increase very much in the future because of negative rate. While we have an increase, mechanical increase, of uh, uh, the capital requirements, the European Banking Authority came out with a statement and an impact study showing that for Basel IV, the top eight global CIF in Europe will have an increase of CT1 of 28%. Mm -hmm. While in the US, it will be 5% only. So if you increase the denominator of the ROT by 28%, your ROT goes down, everything has been equal by 20%. And so our European banks are going to be able to attract capital from investor. Capital is debt and is equity. And I think the big battle is this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we make sure that we will drive capital into European banks? You they need capital in order to support the economy. And that's a discussion that uh, we want to open with the European authorities. Not about negative rates, stop doing your monetary policy, etc. They're in charge of it. What do we have to say on that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not about lowering the capital level, they're in charge of it. But there could be smart solutions which uh, can be pushed in terms of transposition of the rules, in terms of uh, you know, the time to apply them, in terms of the nature of the capital, which can make European bank competitive again. And as you say, that, that really bring us, bringing us back to the top, that really underlines the need for a level playing field when it comes to supervision and regulation. Yes. That you should do with Well, it's with a, as much a level playing field on one side with other competitors. Yeah. It's uh, very important to encourage new entrants uh, and to give them facilities to develop. By one stage, everybody has to follow the same rules. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's uh, very important to allow for access to bank data. I'm absolutely fine with that. But it's important that it's a symmetric uh, view with uh, other players. So, you know, we are very focused on that. Okay. Jean-Pierre, a few very quick questions to wrap up, which are really nothing to do with SMEs or banking. Um, a quick fire round. Um, What's the best city in the world? Well, on this one, you're not going to catch me making a choice between <laughs> France, Italy, or the UK. I think it's a small village in the countryside, wherever it is. I'm a simple person. I like to be in nature. And are you uh, actually back to fintech and technology? Are you Apple or Android? We are everything. We introduce <laughs> uh, in Italy Apple Pay, then uh, Google Pay, 
then Samsung Pay, then Alipay. So we love everybody. Platform agnostic, then. Um, and uh, second most important question. You spent a lot of your career at, in a French bank in Paris, and more recently uh, at an Italian bank based out of Milan. French cuisine or Italian cuisine? In a negative rate environment, <laughs> Europe is becoming Japanese, sushi. <laughs> Which segues neatly to the most important question, who's going to win the Rugby World Cup? That is an extremely sensitive question. <laughs> I don't know, but I know that neither the French nor the Italians will win. Et voilà. <laughs> Jean-Pierre, uh, it's been a, a, a pleasure talking with you today uh, about some of the, ch the big changes, the, the tectonic changes uh, in banking and how banks need to rethink their approach uh, to SMEs. Good luck with grappling with that challenge at Unicredit. Uh, and as president of the, the European Banking Federation uh, in the years ahead, on behalf of everyone here today at Cybos, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.